Chapter 5, Lash LaRue. Early on, I learned, without anyone actually telling me, that in this world, it is not enough just to be. You have to be something. So, around the age of five, I decided to be a cowboy. Cowboys rode three trails into my life. One, the Garrick Movie Theater downtown, which showed Western double features on Saturday afternoons. Two, comic books. And three, Frontier Playhouse. Frontier Playhouse came on TV every weekend night at six, or every weeknight at six, right after Howdy Doody, and right in the middle of dinner time. I was not allowed to eat in the living room where the TV was, but I was allowed to move my chair to the doorway between the kitchen and the dining room. I placed my dinner on the seat, knelt down, and watched the nightly cowboy movie while eating on my knees. It's a wonder I could see the platter-sized screen at the far end of the house. From TV and movies and comics, I knew lots of cowboys. Roy Rogers, Gene Autry, Hopalong Cassidy, Lash LaRue, Red Ryder, Tom Mix, The Lone Ranger, Tex Ritter, Ranger Joe, Tim McCoy, Hoot Gibson, and horses. Trigger, Topper, Silver, Champion, Tony, Buttermilk. When my friends and I played cowboys, almost everyone wanted to be Roy Rogers. With his fringed shirts and silky neckerchief and white hat and golden horse, how could you not want to be Roy? I was usually the first to call out, I'll be Roy Rogers! But when I was alone, and my secrets came peeping out from their hiding places, I knew there was a cowboy I wanted to be even more than Roy Rogers. I wanted to be Lash LaRue. From hat to boots, Lash LaRue dressed all in black. But that wasn't what made Lash LaRue special. It was the whip. He carried it coiled at his belt, and with it, he did almost everything the others did with their six shooters. Was a bad guy reaching for his gun? Lash was quicker with his whip. A flick of the wrist, the whip uncoils, leather lightning. Darts ten, twenty, thirty feet across the Dutch to snatch the gun, barely clear of its holster, from the bad guy's hands. Is the bad guy running away? The whip catches him at his ankles, trips and hogties him, ready for the sheriff. The rawhide, rawhide tongue could lick the spit from the horse's lips or kiss it on the ear. Lash LaRue. I recognized him as cool before I ever knew the word. I loved the West. The songs, Home on the Range, Tumbling Tumbleweeds, Red River Valley, Cattle Drives, Sarsaparilla. The movies made Sarsaparilla seem like liquid fire. Imagine my surprise. Years later, when I drank my first glass and discovered it was root beer. Stagecoach holdups, box canyons, harmonicas and campfires, and coyotes howling in the night. I had an armament Roy Rogers himself would have been proud to own. Twin golden pistols and twin white leather holsters. My white leather gun My white leather gun belt had a dozen little leather loops to hold a red wooden bullet to hold a dozen red wooden bullets. Of course the bullets were just for show. The real ammo was caps. Five rolls to a box. They could be bought at one of the two grocery stores, Freylix next door, to, next door, or Truffles across the street. I drew pictures of good guys and bad guys shooting it out. I considered myself an expert at drawing horses, but my favorite part I always saved for last. The orange, red, and yellow streaks that indicated gunfire crisscrossing the picture. Here's a picture of my early artwork, early cowboy artwork. I practiced my drawing until it was as fast as Tim McCoy's. I twirled my golden guns in my fingers. I drank my Ovaltine from a Ranger Joe mug. I played the harmonica. I yodeled. And then, one day in third grade, I went all the way. When I woke up, instead of getting dressed as usual, I put on my cowboy outfit. Ten gallon hat, studded shirt, jawed spurs, golden guns, boots and spurs. My mother must have thought, oh no, as she heard my spurs clanking towards the breakfast table. I drew plenty of stairs on my three-block walk to school. Such was the class facing our teacher, Mrs. Dave, Miss Davis, that morning. Twenty-five pupils and one cowboy. She probably checked her calendar to see if, if this was Halloween. I remember her looking down at me in the first row, smiling gently and saying, Jerry, would you like to do something for us? Apparently, I did, for I stood, faced the class, and serenaded them with, I got spurs that jingle, jangle, jingle and shook my boots. A couple of summers later, I had the chance to really live the cowboy life. I had gotten a pup tent for Christmas. Now I could camp out, pretend I was on a cattle drive, 
pretend our backyard was a tumbleweed range somewhere in Texas or Wyoming. I invited my other best friend, Roger Edelman, to join me. We laid out our blankets in the tent. We talked and played card games, and as the sun went down, we turned on the battery-powered lantern and played some more. <clears throat> Eventually, it was time to go to bed. We crawled under our covers and turned off the lantern. An hour later, I was still awake. I had never known it got so dark on the range and so quiet. No cows mooing, no coyotes calling, only Roger's breathing, and the ground. Even with a blanket, it was so hard. How did the cattle stand it? In vain, I kept trying to sleep. I felt immense and bristling, the only soul awake on the planet. I longed for a nightlight. When I couldn't stand it any longer, I shook Roger awake. Five minutes later, he was trudging homeward while I climbed in my bed, in my bedroom. Alas, I was not at home on the range after all. I was strictly a living room cowboy. That ends chapter five. Please read over your questions and go back into the text to answer them before moving on to the next chapter.